We are excited to have you back for another episode of Scientifically Speaking, and we're going to be discussing cellulite today. And with me is Dr. Michael McLean from Endo Pharmaceuticals and Dr. Nazian Saidi from Thomas Jefferson University. So, Dr. McLean, tell us a little bit about yourself and your hat. Sure, Mike McLean, uh, Medical Director, Endo Aesthetics. And let me give you a little bit of background. Give me 30 seconds to describe why I have a Columbia hat on. I'm not an alumni. My son's at Cornell, so he's upset by this. But this is an honor of Enos Mandel. She was the scientist who first discovered collagenase, and we'll get into that a little bit later. She was the one to discover it at Columbia, and an interesting lady. Now, why do I actually focus on her? Um, because that collagenase was the actual jumping point for many indications, including Quo, the one we'll talk about today. That is fantastic. And Dr. Naz Saidi is the director of the cosmetic and laser unit at Thomas Jefferson University, and she is a board certified dermatologist and fellowship trained in aesthetic dermatology. My baseball hat is a Phillies hat. So I am in Philly, but I actually grew up here. I did my training everywhere but in Philadelphia. And um, even currently, when my husband and I moved to more suburban life, we still live in Philadelphia. So I'm a diehard Philadelphia fan. I know it rubs people the wrong way. My husband's from Boston and a diehard Boston fan. But I love Philly sports, and I basically love everything Philly. Excellent. So I'm Joel Cohn. I'm a dermatologist and fellowship trained in aesthetics and Mohs surgery, and I practice in Denver, Colorado. And I'm excited to be speaking with everybody today, um, and Dr. McLean and Dr. Sadie and Wally Klemp about cellulite. And this is an area that we know that there's a lot of excitement and a lot of recent innovations and a lot of attention. So first, my, my hat and my background, uh, I grew up as a hockey player. My son is a hockey player. Hockey is our family sport. My wife and I went on many of our initial first dates at the University of Michigan Hockey Arena at Yost Arena. And just last week, I found out that our family friend and one of my all-time favorite hockey players, Tony Granato, is going to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. And Tony Granato's sister, Cami Granato, is also in the Hockey Hall of Fame because she was on Team USA uh, women's hockey and won the gold medal. So as we get to cellulite, let's talk specifically about, you know, our understanding of cellulite is really people who have dimples from sort of pulling down the area of these fibroceptase within areas of fat. And then some people also have laxity and undulations to the skin. And if we really look to the literature out there in terms of how prevalent this is, over 90% of women in their lifetime will have cellulite. And there are psychosocial studies that shows that this really causes a lot of dermatology life quality index concern about the appearance of this in terms of what this looks like, what outfits to wear. So there have been some really recent developments in overall the treatment of cellulite. And I'll go to Dr. McLean. Um, you know, in terms of your market research before you at Endo Pharmaceuticals decided to really look into the collagenase that you spoke of to help dissolve those fibroceptase. Tell us about the market for cellulite from a corporate perspective. Yeah, it's a great question, Dr. Cohen. So obviously anytime pharma goes into it, before they actually invest the money and the effort, they wanna know what that market looks like. So we are already in collagenase in different markets for different indications. And it became obvious to us once we recognized that that collagen septite is a pr predominant factor, that that actually might be a great target for us. So we went out with market research, and that actually goes through mul multiple quantitative qualitatives. And what it indicated, not only what you had stated, right, that over 90%, but just how bothersome um, it actually affects the quality of life of these women. So, you know, from a person who sees a fair number of people with cellulite on a regular basis, you know, a lot of these treatments that we've done historically focus on things like subcision. So I've taken a no core needle and I think Doris Hexel is one of the first people to really publish on this um, from Brazil about just sort of releasing that fibroceptase. And then I've treated people with the Selfina device and I've 
participated in a clinical trial, a long-term trial for that. And I, I agree with you. I think there are people, and I can think of one patient in particular who was a high school track star, and she noticed that even in her shorts, there were areas of cellulite, and she had been a runner her entire life. So uh, at the age of 26, she came in, and I released some of these areas, and she had a very very significant improvement and was very happy with things. You know, from a perspective of a practitioner, Dr. Saidi, you as well see patients and it's not always that clear cut. They don't always have dimples. They have sort of a complicated cellulite pattern. So can you tell us some of the treatment modalities that you're currently using to treat these patients, often in combination? Sure. Um, so I totally agree with what you're saying, Joel. A lot of patients, um, they have the dimples, but then they also have skin laxity or just unevenness in their skin. And some of these women that I see, they're active. They work out an hour plus a day. They're thin, um, but they still have cellulite. So it's, not, it's kind of like this misconception in the public that having cellulite means that you're overweight or fat. So, you know, from a perspective of quo, Dr. McLean, can you talk to us about, you know, the mechanism of action specifically on a collagenase and the septa, and then work us through the pivotal trial? I was an investigator for the pivotal trial. Sure. And actually, there's a slide that actually I'll speak to here on the mechanism of action. It's just a three panel slide that actually addresses what you set up at the beginning as the basis, right? That, that septi pulling down on the underside of the dermal uh, surface that actually causes that surface contour alteration. In addition to that, the adipocytes kind of get pushed into these lobules and, and protrude into that hypodermal dermal interface, pushing up, kind of a protrusion up. And then also um, the thinning of the, of the uh, dermal layer um, contributes to also that contour alteration. But primarily, it's that septi that actually is the central point to it. As you mentioned, you can go in and do manual mechanical subcision. Our drug, and you can see in the second panel, actually is injected in. And think of it as an enzymatic lysis of that, an enzymatic subcision. It, those collagenase molecules that you see can actually attach to the collagen septi, degrade it, and allow that septi uh, to be released and the dimple surface now comes back up to a smoother uh, situation. Now the mechanism is, is unknown as you'd see in the label, but we're doing some really interesting research. And so we're actually seeing an enzymatic subcision followed by remodeling that, that we find very interesting at this point. So the preclinical work and the pilot work clearly showed efficacy and then you set up the pivotal trial. So from the pivotal trial perspective, you enrolled patients who had moderate to severe dimple cellulite, and they received repeat injections, and then that was over a time course. So talk to us about the results of the clinical trial and what you actually saw. Sure, and again, um, you set it up nicely, right? And one of the things that as we developed this, we actually uh, tweaked some of the injection technique, the length of the needle, a lot of things to actually hit the, the efficacy that we saw. And, and you being one of the principal investigators at the site, uh, you recognizing the dosing regime that we had used of, of three treatment sessions, approximately 21 days apart. But more importantly, actually, what was critical both for us and for the FDA was to develop a scale that could actually monitor the improvement that we hopefully would see in these trials. And, and you were actually critical to that component and your publication speaks nicely to it. Um, but we actually developed uh, two separate scales, one for the patient to use and one for the clinician to use to actually rate their improvement. And the FDA with us agreed that we needed to see two levels of improvement on cellulite severity to be called a responder. So that was actually kind of the basis of our primary endpoint in that clinical trial. But I don't know if you wanted to speak a little bit about the scale validation that we had worked with you on. Yes, you know, uh, thank you. Uh, honestly, it was an honor to participate in the scale validation process. And really, you know, when a scale is developed, it's, it's really important that it is useful for a study. If you look at a specific picture, you can look at that picture and classify those dimples as a clear cut grade two or a grade three in terms of moderate or severe. So, you know, we look at the depth of the dimple, the number of dimples, and this has just been published 
in dermatologic surgery. And this was a really great project that I did with several um, co-participants, including Neil Sadik and Mitch Goldman as well. So I think really having a validated scale for physicians to use and for patients to use puts everybody on the same page and makes it helpful going forward in terms of integrating that scale so we can really evaluate improvement. So if you can speak to improvement overall from that study um, that was done from a pivotal standpoint. Sure, so we had to run two identical uh, parallel studies, so we call them sister studies, and they're the largest cellulite studies ever run. Combined, it's 843 subjects were in these two combined trials, so very large subject numbers compared to some of the other cellulite uh, studies that have been published. And what we saw was in the two studies, when we combine it, you can see on the graph um, on the display here that it was a 6.6% responder rate, meaning 6.6% of the population had a two-level improvement, both in the CR and in the PR. And that was, you'll see, is, is indicated as a target buttock. So again, another component that's not quite um, uh, appreciated a lot is to uh, remove as much bias as possible Selected randomly, either the left buttock or the right buttock, to be the target buttock that would dictate what that person was in the response um, at the end of the study. And we were blinded. We were blinded both to the treatment as well as the subject, the investigator, and it was blinded to which target buttock was selected by our randomization scheme. So the 6.6% the that you see is actually reflected on the next one as if you look at either buttock, meaning the subject responded in either the left or the right, you can see that it goes up to over 9% at that point. And then a point that um, you had brought up a few weeks ago, and we went back and did some post hoc analysis on this, we found it very interesting, uh, Dr. Cohen, is that the age in the BMI, again, the demographics of this study was anybody above 18 could be enrolled, which, and we actually went up to 78 as the high end of the age, anybody BMI could enroll. And we went up as high as 67 on the BMI. So these, these quite w wide range of patients uh, came into the study. But when we went back and looked at subgroup analysis, again, post hoc subgroup analysis, you can see on this graph, as you continue to reduce a cutoff at 32 and then less than 60 years of age, less than 50 years of age and less than 40 years of age, you actually go about 20% on the responder rate of the two point. And I think uh, actually the thing that speaks more than words or these figures is actually to show you a couple of photos, if you'd like, of a two point responder that we have. And this is actually something you're familiar with. It's called an alabaster 3D rotational. And you can see the improvement of the dimples very well on the 3D uh, animation of that subject. And also there's a subject at a one level because what we found from the market research that I started off at the beginning even a one level change um, can actually be important to the subject. And in fact, your, your paper, your validation paper showed that a one level change is clinically meaningful to the patient. So what were the actual one level improvement numbers? Yeah, the one level improvement numbers were actually much higher as you'd expect over the, uh, the two level components. So those were in the 40% range. And what we're looking at now is that same subgroup analysis that we did for the two point, meaning as you decrease the age subgroups, does that one point go up? And that's what we're actually doing right now behind the scenes. So Dr. Sadie, from your clinical experience, does that really echo what Dr. McLean is saying in terms of you know, when you see a patient and you employ modalities to treat cellulite, are you seeing more improvement for younger patients and, and patients with a lower BMI? Or really, what's your approach to seeing improvement for these people? Um, I see more improvement in patients who are younger. Um, I think that BMI does play an issue, um, but in these with these other treatment modalities, if patients have very lax skin, that's also contributing to the appearance of cellulite or exacerbating the appearance, they're not gonna respond as well to the devices and injectables. And you know, the laxity and what we see clinically, you know, can be very tough in terms of the whole spectrum of cellulite. You mentioned using radio frequency technology and hyperdilute fillers. So, you know, first, 
let's let's talk about radio frequency. So the radio frequency, the bipolar fractional radio frequency devices that are out there, there are insulated needles and non-insulated needles. And then you can choose different depths of engagement, 1.5 to really 3.5 millimeters. Can you speak to your approach to treating these, these patients with laxity with these devices? Sure. So I have been using more just, um, I use the radio frequency devices with microneedling because I find that that improves skin texture more in those areas. But I've been leaning more towards just using monopolar RF more than anything. Um, and I've had more consistent results with that. Um, the device that I use is the Sinusure temperature device. Um, and by doing treatments in two week intervals and having patients do a series of treatments, about four to five treatments, um, you can see improvement in the appearance of laxity, but also in the appearance of their cellulite over that time course. Um, when using the RF microneedling devices, I tend to use the deeper, uh, the longer depth needles, and I use insulated needles as opposed to the non-insulated um, to protect the epidermis. Um, but I've shifted more towards using monopolar RF than using the microneedling devices. Okay. And then, you know, looking at the dilute fillers, so people have looked at dilute radius as well as dilute sculptra. Really, what's your approach for, for these people? Is it really focusing in on these areas where there's some peaks and nadirs and taking the nadirs and just trying to lift it up and add some structural support? Um, and how do you reconstitute and what's your treatment interval? Sure. So um, I, you know, there are great reports out and studies out using hyperdilute uh, sculpture and hyperdilute radius. Personally, I've had more success using hyperdilute radius, and you can use it in a ratio of one to two dilutions to one to five. Um, and I tend to use more of a one to three to one to five, and it just depends on the patient. So if a patient has more of those depressions that I need to create substance for, I'll use a lower dilution, so one to three. But if it's an older patient who has more creepiness to the skin, I'll use a one to five dilution because I don't want them to have any skin irregularities or any bumps from the treatment. And then in terms of bringing them back and following them and repeat injection, how do you do that? I typically tell them um, from the beginning, this isn't going to be a one and done treatment. Um, we're going to see each other multiple times. And along the way, you'll see improvement, but you'll also continue seeing improvement after we're done the series of treatments. My treatment interval is four to six weeks in between the treatments. And I tell them two to three treatments. So Dr. McLean, still on the subject of injectables, when we look specifically at Quo, which has now been FDA approved um, for the treatment of dimple cellulite, during the course of the study, the patients were allowed to have 12 injections in the buttock in the area of the dimple. So um, can you take us through the injection, the type of needle, the, the delivery of the collagenase, and then what some people sort of experience in terms of your pain scores, as well as some of the swelling or bruising that was seen in the studies? Sure, so th the injection technique is critical to it. Um, it's something that we developed uh, through the earlier studies, but the actual injection is done using a one cc syringe attached to a 30 gauge one half inch le length needle. That one half inch length gets down to the, what we call the trunk of the septi. So you're not just clipping some of the tree branches that hold the, the underside of the dermis. Um, in the injection, since we can't see the septi uh, with our own visual, the injection technique is actually perpendicular to the skin. You pull back out, I'm sorry, deposit 0.1 ml. You pull the tip almost out and redirect the tip 45 degree angle uh, to the cephalic, deposit another 0.1, and then caudal, 45 degrees caudal, 0.1. What the idea is, without being able to see the septi with our own eyes, hopefully we're depositing kind of a, uh, of a, a 0.3 ml that will surround that septi to allow it to be released with the collagenase. Uh, and the injection technique is correct. It's up to 12 injections per buttock. 
um, and therefore both buttocks were treated for 24 total injections. And they were allowed during the trial, if it was a, a more of an elongated um, dimple, they could actually do two injections approximately two centimeters apart to actually flood the septide bands that might be holding that down. So Dr. McLean, so in the course of this trial, we did not control for people who were on, on a host of different vitamins and herbal supplements, ginseng, garlic, ginger, ginkgo, kava kava, celery root, fish oils, vitamin E, those types of things, and didn't really control for people who um, really went out to Orange Theory or had major workouts and things like that. Um, you know, so in terms of real life experience, Nas, can you talk to some of the things that you typically tell your patients, really specifically after like injectables, like, like the dilute radius? Sure. So um, a lot of these patients are motivated patients at baseline, but that also means that they're very active. Um, so I do tell them for 24 hours not to do any kind of intense exercise. They can go for a walk, um, which most of them don't consider exercise, um, but that's really the extent of their activity. Um, I tell them not to do activities like Orange Theory or Soul Cycle. Um, COVID times makes it a little easier for that, um, but to really be mindful full of their activity over the next 24 hours. Um, when I do them, the devices, um, I'm not as concerned so they can resume normal activity um, and the downtime with monopolar RF is minimal. And then, you know, I think there's obviously a tremendous amount of excitement at some of the happenings in cellulite with Quo becoming approved and expecting us to see it in 2021 and then some of the other technologies that, that are on the radar. So, so Naz, can you speak to you know, other technologies that you're aware of on the radar? You know, we spoke to Wally Klemp and we, we heard a little bit about Soliton and the acoustic subcision, but really how do you think you and I and other cosmetic and aesthetic physicians are gonna be treating sort of cellulite in general a year from now and then a few years from now sort of in combination? I think that, um, Joel, I think we're going to be treating in combination. And I think that our combinations are going to get a little bit more elaborate. So uh, using Quo to treat the dimples and then using um, maybe some of the other devices like Soliton also to treat, break down the fibrous bands. Um, but then I also think there's still going to be a place for using these hyper dilute fillers in patients who have crepey skin or who need improvement in their skin laxity um, as well. But I think it's going to, our algorithm for treating these patients is going to get a little bit more complicated, but I think our overall treatments are going to be more effective. And then Dr. McLean, what are your plans for really, you know, thinking about the launch of Quo? I know you guys are in the planning stages of a lot of exciting things. And then, you know, really what else are you looking at in terms of Quo um, going forward in terms of other studies? Yes, <clears throat> so, so we're looking at, uh, and again, this is a, a great opportunity for people like yourself, Dr. Saeed, to actually um, suggest ideas to us, right, through um, ISRs or something of that nature from the aesthetic side. There's maybe four or five things that we have uh, bubbling in the background that we're thinking of um, that probably come to your mind also. But the, the activities behind the scene at Pharma, if you've never been there for a launch, are unbelievable. And it <clears throat> doesn't compare to, you know, four nights of call from your old days type of thing. But it really is intensive as, as the commercial group 